hope I'm audible. Yes, Nina, you are. We can start. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, and give, uh, good evening to all of you. It's indeed a pleasure to welcome all the faculty members, researchers, and students across the globe who has joined us for this momentous occasion today. Before we begin, let's observe a few moments of silence. Thank you. So today we're here to attend Berkman's erudite lecture organized by the Saint Depart uh, Department of Physics and English of St. Berkman's College. Uh, well, my name is Nina Abraham and I'm accompanied by my co uh, colleague, Dan George. So over to you, Dan. Thank you, Nina. My name is Dan George and I would just like to read a few guidelines that the participants are humbly requested to keep in mind to ensure the smooth functioning of our program. All the questions intended for the Q&A session are to be posted in the chat box, addressing it to everyone. A feedback form will be posted at the end of the webinar in both Zoom and YouTube, which the participants are requested to fill in accurately to obtain their e-certificates. Participants are also kindly requested not to introduce yourselves in the chat box as this might distract the speaker. Well, these were just a few points to keep in mind. Thank you for listening. Over to you, Nina. Thank you, Dan. Now it's time uh, to call upon Dr. Jacob Matthew, the principal of St. Berkman's College, for the welcome address. So over to you, sir. Thank you, Nina and Dan. A very warm hearted morning to the invited guest, Sir Anthony James Leggett, and good evening to all other dignitaries, organizers, teachers, retired teachers of this institution, teachers from neighboring colleges and schools, research scholars, and my dear students. I remember a great scientist once telling that, within quote, the people who do make big discoveries are the ones who somehow manage to free themselves from the conventional ways of thinking and to see the subject from a new perspective, unquote. Indeed, as the head of this institution, I honestly believe that success of this home of knowledge is only due to the people and the students who constantly, within quote, free themselves and think out of the box to make wonders happen. In fact, we have the Nobel Prize winner, physicist himself, who made the above statement on board to share his experience on the subject of his expertise. Prior to sliding into, onto my duty of welcoming everyone, I would love to welcome everyone to our humble institution, St. Berkman's College founded in 1922 by Venerable Mar Thomas Kurialisheri, Bishop of the Diocese of Chengnasheri. It is my pleasure to extend a cheerful welcome to you all to this series, <coughs> serious academic venture, Bells. Berkman's erudite lecture series was instituted in 2012 by the faculty of the college from their own contributions to mark the 90th year, now the celebrations of the college. It aims to invite scholars of repute in various disciplines, preferably Nobel laureates, to campus for lectures and interactions with the faculty, students, and selected members of the public. This is the third one in the series, and previous speakers include Professor E. Ashi Nageshi and Professor Adda E. Yonath. Sir Anthony James Leggett, Nobel Laureate in Physics, 2003, Professor Emeritus, University of Illinois, will deliver the third lecture in this series. There are no words which can convey our awe and respect for Sir Anthony James Leggett. We would like to take this opportunity to tell him that it is our honor and privilege to welcome you here. Hearty welcome, sir. Our manager, Reverend Dr. Thomas Padith, who does not need a formal introduction at all. He is with us in all our endeavors and motivates us to do the task with the utmost sincerity, commitment. Dear Father, I would proudly welcome you to this function. I would like to extend our warm welcome to the teachers from neighboring colleges, schools, research scholars, independent scholars, and students from neighboring colleges and schools. Again, I would like to welcome all my dear colleagues behind this program. 
Professor P.J. Thomas, Mr. Ajay Jose, the committee members of the Berkman's Uridate Lecture Series, who have constantly extended their love and support to this great event. And with gratitude, I remember the effort they put to conduct this event. And last but not the least, I would like to welcome our former teachers, teachers from various departments and students from the different departments who are the part and parcel of this institution in my modest words. I hope and request you your benign cooperation throughout this program for its grand success. Once again, I welcome you all to our college and hope that you will have very exciting and enriching academic session. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We welcome you too to this program. Reverend Dr. Thomas Padieth, the manager of St. Berkman's College, is in his annual mediation and is unable to be with us this evening. However, he has been kind enough to send us his words of felicitation, which we shall now see. Honorable Professor, Sir Anthony James Leggett, the speaker of the day, Professor Jacob Matthew, the college principal, Professor P.J. Thomas, the convener of this lecture series, respected professors and dear participants from different parts of the world. A very cordial greetings to all of you. I am quite sure that all of you are eagerly awaiting Berkman's Erudite Lecture 2020. As many of you know, this lecture series was instituted by the faculty members of this college, St. Berkman's College, in 2012 in connection with the Navadi celebration of the college. I express my sincere appreciation and gratitude to the pioneers who instituted this lecture series. It is indeed an academic endeavor, an academic endeavor which has been appreciated by everybody. And this year, we have Sir Anthony James Leggett as our guest of honor. From the part of the management and in the name of our Archbishop and Patron of the College, I express my sincere appreciation and gratitude to Professor Sir Anthony James for accepting our invitation. He is the Nobel Laureate of 2003 for Physics. What we need today is an interface between science, technology, and religion for the betterment of humanity. In physics, we discuss basically what is related to the time and space. But this should give an opportunity th to think with regard to what is beyond physics, namely the metaphysical. I wish and pray that all our efforts lead us from physics to metaphysics as well. Finally, I express my sincere appreciation to the organizers of this lecture series. Especially, I remember Professor Jacob Matthew, the college principal, and Professor P.J. Thomas, the convener of this lecture series, and Professor Ajay Jones, the secretary. Once again, wishing you all a very fruitful time in spite of the challenges that we all face by the COVID-19. Thank you. Once again, wishing all success. God bless you all. Thank you. Well, thank you, Father. Next, we have Professor P.J. Thomas, the head of the Department of English and also the convener of today's program to introduce the speaker of the day. So over to you, sir. Thank you. And all the distinguished participants and Professor Anthony Leggett, it's great an honor to kind of make a few words here. And I'm in a dilemma also because literally introducing 
a Nobel laureate would be like emptying an ocean into a shell. Uh, it's true uh, with the time that is given to me and also my expertise. There are a lot of physicists here ready to listen to him. And if I say something about physics, it would be like carrying uh, you know, coal to the Newcastle. And therefore, I don't, need, uh, I don't intend to say anything at all about physics except some basic facts. But I just want to uh, draw your attention to a life sketch that uh, Professor Leggett has published online. And uh, I was struck with a few uh, ideas there. And something that I want to say today is that uh, Professor Leggett's life and career can be described by uh, serendipity. And that's what he too claims in his life sketch. It's a lot of interesting things and accidents in his life. And serendipitously, serendipitously uh, it's interesting that he was trained in a Catholic uh, Jesuit school. And he was influenced tremendously by Catholic Jesuit priests. And second thing is that he was trained in classics and in analytical philosophy. And in fact, uh, uh, I am from literature and somehow um, this is very serendipitous that uh, I got to associate with Professor Leggett uh, in 2013 through a common as uh, associate of us, Dr. Raghavan. And I remember Dr. Raghavan also with gratitude. And so uh, it's interesting to note that uh, uh, Professor Leggett actually had training in classics and literature. And in fact, it's a huge loss to literature that became again in physics. And uh, uh, so he left philosophy, analytic philosophy, because he thought that there was no evidence. And he himself says that he was exploring the possibility of being wrong without being stupid. And that is what brought him to physics. But anyway, um, uh, just for the sake of some formal facts, which you all know, uh, Sir Anthony James Leggett is currently Professor Emeritus at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He's a world leader in the theory of low temperature physics. His pioneering work on superfluidity was recognized by the 2003 Nobel Prize in Physics. He set directions for research in the quantum physics of macroscopic dissipative system. So today, um, uh, Professor Leggett, Leggett is with us and it's really an honor and it's actually a a, a constant and consistent work of around six years that get fructified today. So I'm really honored to have Professor Leggett to deliver the third uh, Berkman's erudite lecture. So hearty welcome to this Catholic institution and uh, over to you, Professor Leggett, for your lecture. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you all very much for these uh, kind remarks. Um, it's a, a pleasure to be able to give this um, er erudite lecture. Uh, could you show the first slide, please? Yeah, uh, actually the next one, please. That's just my title, but uh, you can show the next one. Yeah, good. So this um, gr uh, slide, shows the temperature scale as we are more or less uh, used to it. Um, that is the um, uh, Celsius uh, uh, temperature scale. And um, you see that we are right now on room temperature, something like 300 um, uh, degrees. Um, the um, temperature at the coldest Champaign-Urbana winter, Champaign-Urbana is my hometown here in Illinois, um, is just a little below that. And we have to go down quite a long way on this scale to see uh, even where liquid nitrogen boils. So most of the things I'm going to be talking about in this lecture fall right at the bottom of this scale on the right. In fact, many of them are so close to zero that you can't actually distinguish it from zero on this uh, scale. So you might think that low temperature physics, which is my main subject area, is a very, very narrow uh, field, They're just confined to a very tiny uh, region of uh, experience. But actually that's quite wrong. It's much more sensible to show the temperature scale in a different way, the so-called logarithmic scale. Can we have the next slide, please?
Could I get the next slide, please? Oh, yeah, get the next one after that. Yeah, thanks. Okay, here we go. Okay, so this is the temperature scale plotted in a different way, the so-called logarithmic scale, where each interval corresponds to a factor of 10. So on this uh, scale, you see that conventional superconductivity, which is one of the things I'm going to be talking about, occurs uh, right at the top of the, the, uh, the page. Um, superfluid helium-3, which is something I've uh, worked on uh, a lot. Um, so, sorry, that's uh, liquid helium-4. Um, I've also worked on that. That occurs at about uh, one degree. We go down by another factor or two factors of 10, and we find that liquid helium-3 becomes superfluid, and that is the topic on which I've really worked a lot. We go down another factor of uh, 10 or so, we find the lowest temperature achieved in any bulk, bulk solid, but you can get even better than that. You can go to alkali gases, and again, we'll get at something I'm going to be talking about there, occurring at about one 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 hundred thousandth of a room temperature. And in fact, we can even go to systems which are colder than that, but I, I won't actually be talking about that very much. So you see that uh, looked at this way, low temperature physics is not at all a, a small part of the uh, of re reality, as it were. Um, it, it has a very uh, rich and wide scope. Okay, but my talk is about quantum liquids. So could we go on to the next slide, please? Yeah. Okay, now to, to get a quantum liquid, you need three ingredients. And I'll explain all of these in more detail in a moment, but um, first of all, we need low temperatures, which guarantee us a high degree of order, as we'll see in a minute. We need quantum mechanics, which means that particles show wave behavior. And sorry, can you just keep, keep the last one on, keep slide four on? Can you just go back to slide four for a moment? Uh, no, the one before that. Yeah, yeah, good, thank you. So we need quantum mechanics because we're going to need particles to show wave behavior. And finally, we do actually need a liquid or something like a liquid in order that particles should be able to change places. If we put all these ingredients together, we find the um, systems which we can call quantum liquids, and they are systems which show not just the effects of quantum mechanics, but also the effects of indistinguishability of elementary particles. Again, I'll talk about that in a bit more detail in a moment. I'm going to be particularly interested in the special class of quantum liquids, which are the superfluids, and they show quantum behavior on a macroscopic scale, and that's what makes them particularly interesting. So next slide, please. Thank you. But this is just to, to illustrate the general idea that uh, high temperatures tend to correspond to, to disorder and low temperatures to order. If we have a um, simple system like, say, water, H2O, then at high um, temperatures, room temperature, uh, the system will be liquid, the atoms will, or molecules rather, the molecules will be just randomly oriented and moreover moving. Um, if we go to low temperatures, of course, the uh, liquid will freeze, get ice, and uh, in ice, the molecules are all uh, ordered in a very nice pattern relative to one another, and moreover, they don't, don't move or not very much. Second example is a magnetic solid, like, say, iron. At high enough temperatures, actually in the case of iron, really quite high temperatures, above about 12,000 degrees, absolute, um, we find that the small magnets, which we can think of as um, constituting the uh, electronic state of the system, those small magnets are completely disordered and pointing in random directions. However, if we now cool the system down and go through the ferromagnetic phase transition, then we find that in the ferromagnetic phase, which is what in fact iron is in, room temperature, 
uh, we'll find that these uh, uh, magnets are uh, all ordered parallel to one another. And finally, we can think about a disordered alloy, like, like say, uh, a copper zinc, a bit of brass. Um, in the high temperature uh, regime, we find that at the red atoms, say copper, are positioned randomly relative to the blue atoms, which is zinc. But if we go to low enough temperatures, we find that the uh, copper atoms take up a very ordered pattern relative to the zinc atoms and vice versa. So in all these cases, we see that going from high temperatures to low temperatures uh, means uh, in effect going from a very disordered system to a much better ordered one. And that's one ingredient we want in quantum liquids. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Now, you remember my second ingredient was that we need to be able to regard particles as waves. So um, imagine that we have a light source. Uh, um, this is an experiment which perhaps some of you might have even done in the laboratory. We take a, um, a, a, an appropriate light source and we shine it on a screen in which there are two holes cut. And we'll see that if we now detect the light on a subsequent screen, we find a very definite pattern of dark and white uh, light lines. Now you can do that experiment, not, not just with light, but also so with electrons, and you get the same result, quite surprisingly at first. And so it looks like as if in some, some circumstances, particles behave uh, like waves. Um, and in fact, de Broglie, way, way back nearly 100 years ago now, um, determined a quantitative relation between the wave and particle properties. So what he said essentially was that the wavelength, which is a wave property, can be related to a couple of particle properties, namely the mass and velocity of the particle. And in that relation there stands a particular constant, uh, Planck's constant, which in ordinary units is very, very tiny. And that's one of the reasons why we don't see um, the wave properties of particles very easily at, say, room temperature. Um, but, so let's go on to the next UF, please. Next slide. Thank you. So, uh, as I say, we don't normally think of uh, particle, what we normally think of as particles, like electrons or atoms, um, behaving like a wave. Why is that? Well, here's part, at least, of the reason. Suppose that we have a wave um, coming in from the left in the, in the, at the top of the screen, um, and that wave has a wavelength lambda. And we now put it through an aperture uh, which has a size A, which is much larger than the wavelength. So uh, what happens, crudely speaking, is that the wave just goes straight on. Um, there are no so-called diffraction effects, I'll come to those in a moment. The wave just basically goes, uh, or the bit of the wave which is opposite the, uh, the uh, aperture, just goes straight on. In other words, uh, the wave shows basically particle-like behavior. Um, you can't tell from that experiment alone that they are dealing with waves and not particles. On the other hand, if we go to the second diagram, we consider a wave with a much longer wavelength, lambda, um, and uh, it's also, again, incident on a slit or, or a hole. And now the uh, dimension of the hole um, is uh, uh, comparable to or smaller than the wavelength. Under those conditions, we get the, the phenomena known as diffraction um, and interference. I think a nice illustration of these two different types of behavior is given by the fact that we can normally um, see, we, uh, sorry, uh, we can uh, normally hear around a corner, uh, but we can't see around or through a closed door, we, uh, through, through, sorry, through an open door. Or, and the reason for that is that when we're talking about sound, then the wavelength of the sound 
is usually at least of the order of the size of the door, doorway, um, maybe even larger. And so we get a lot of diffraction and interference. And that's part of the reason why we can hear around a doorway. On the other hand, with light, the wavelength is very, very tiny compared to the size of the door. And so we can't see around corners. Um, let's try to um, see, try to make the condition a bit more quantitative. Well, the Bowley already told us that lambda is h over mv. So to get lambda um, greater than or of the order of a, the size of the diffracting uh, aperture, we have to have v less than the order h divided by ma. Um, now, what, what should we take to be a in the case, say, of a gas of atoms? Well, crudely speaking, it's something like the distance between the atoms. So um, if we um, put that in and notice also that um, V is related to temperature by the Boltzmann's uh, formula, a half mv squared is order kt, then we see that in order to get wave effects in a gas, we would need this boxed formula. The temperature should be less than or equal to Planck's constant squared divided by twice the mass times Boltzmann's constant times the distance A between particles. Now, as I said, in a gas, liquid or solid, we can take this liquid width to be the interparticle spacing. And if you plug that into the boxed formula, we see that to get wave-like behavior for atoms, we actually need that um, the temperature should be less than about uh, 20 degrees Kelvin divided by the atomic number. And that by itself is not such a severe constraint. Nowadays, it's quite easy to attain that. Uh, but we'll see in a moment, that's not all we need to do. Um, in the case of electrons in the liquid or solid phase, um, of the, say of a metal, then they will basically show wave-like behavior at all temperatures. Again, that's not gonna be quite enough for us. So let's go on to the next um, slide, please. And we'll get the third ingredient. Uh, next slide, please. Good. So the third ingredient, remember, was we needed our system, which was essentially liquid. Why? Well, in a gas, um, the under most conditions, though not all, it turns out that the de Broglie wavelength, lambda, is very small compared to the distance between particles, between atoms. So essentially, in gases under most conditions, we see no, no wave-like or quantum effects. Okay, so let's go uh, now to a solid. What about a solid? In a solid at low temperature, it's certainly true that um, the de Broglie wavelength it can be considerably greater than the distance between atoms. But the atoms are pretty much fixed in position and don't change places. So that, that um, is not quite enough for us. We do want the atoms to be able to change places. So in other words, to get a quantum liquid, what we need is a system which is liquid at low temperatures so that the atoms can change places, um, but also um, so that the de Broglie wavelength is greater than uh, A, the distance between atoms. So, so to sum up then, to get a quantum liquid, we need that the temperature is less than about 20 degrees uh, Kelvin divided by the atomic number. And moreover, the system is liquid. So that actually doesn't give us too many systems. In the case of atoms, uh, it is for, that condition is fulfilled for, liquid, for, for helium, um, which is liquid below about um, five degrees absolute. Um, and uh, also it's fulfilled in ultra cold atomic gases. Uh, in the case of electrons, basically that, those conditions are fulfilled for all um, liquid or solid metals. They have to be metals because it has to be, uh, the electrons have to be liquid, that is they have to be able to move around. And they can do that in a metal, but of course not in an insulator. Okay, the next slide please. Now, a very important ingredient in the analysis of quantum liquids is the indistinguishability 
of elementary particles. We've seen that particles, at least under some conditions, do behave like waves. What that means is that it's impossible to tag them. So we might try, say, to start off with a couple of atoms, which we uh, name Bob and Fred. But then remember that they're behaving as waves. So when we come out at the end of the day, it's not clear which is Bob and which is Fred. What could have happened was either of two things. Either the uh, top of the uh, top uh, a diagram with the dashed lines, or the bottom one. So one simply doesn't know uh, which of these two processes uh, took place, and there was really no means of ever knowing, as long as the particles do indeed behave like waves. However, for that property to be important, uh, it's essential that the uh, systems in question, the particles in question, uh, must be able to change places. Um, a very nice, for the, this is a bit more a, a technical remark, but um, for, for those of you who do know about such things, a very nice illustration of this principle is given by the spectroscopy of the carbon molecule, which is two carbon atoms. If we have two um, carbon atoms of different uh, isotopic numbers, which makes them so carbon 12 and carbon 13, um, then essentially you can tag them by their uh, isotopic uh, number, so there's no effect of indistinguishability. If we have two carbon 12s, there may be effects of indistinguishability. But now what, what actually turns out, and this was verified many, many years ago, is that if you study the vibrational spectra of a carbon, uh, uh, of a carbon molecule, in which the atoms are merely doing this, then you see no effects of the indistinguishability. But if you look at the rotational properties in which they're going around one another, then you do indeed see spectacular effects um, on of indistinguishability. In fact, some of the spectral lines just don't occur under those conditions. So, so this just emphasizes the fact that um, for, for indistinguishability to be important, the particles must be able to change places. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, well, a, um, one result, not the only result, but one result of the indistinguishability of, of um, elementary particles is that um, they obey so-called quantum statistics. And the, however, there are two different types of elementary particle. There are so-called fermions, uh, which are particles which have in units of h over two pi, spin a half or three halves or whatever, that includes particles like the electron, the proton, and the neutron. And these particles are very xenophobic. They can tolerate at most one particle per state. And so what happens at low temperatures is that the lowest energy states are filled up with one particle each, up to a so-called Fermi energy. And thereafter, uh, essentially, you find nothing. The, the number of particles drops off very rapidly to zero. So that's what happens with fermions. However, there's another kind of uh, particles, bosons, which have spin zero or uh, one in units of h over two pi, or, and so on. And for example, the helium atom, uh, helium four atom is one such, such uh, uh, particle. And there we find that bosons are extremely gregarious. They're quite oppositely to fermions, they actually love having more than one particle per state. And in fact, they, they like it so much that at low temperatures and at sufficiently high densities, a macroscopic number of particles, something of the order in a, a typical experiment, of the order of 10 to the 23, will condense into a single uh, one particle state. And that's the phenomenon known as, uh, known as Bose condensation um, or um, Bose-Einstein condensation, BEC. And we believe, in fact, it takes place in uh, liquid helium-4 at about uh, two degrees absolute. Next slide, please. Okay, I think we can skip this slide, perhaps go on to the next one. Yeah, okay. There's a very ni nice illustration of the effects of Bose condensation um, in the, uh, on the cover of science 
for the year 1995, which was the year that ultra cold atomic gases, uh, both, both gases were first realized experimentally. And uh, the science magazine always names a molecule of the year. And on this occasion, they didn't name a real molecule, they named the Bose Einstein condensate. And you see that the Bose Einstein condensate is represented by these blue guys. They're like soldiers all moving in lockstep. Um, there are a few others around, the red and that green ones, and they are atoms which are not um, uh, condensed um, into, the, into the condensate. And they're basically doing their own thing. But the blue guys are all doing exactly the same thing at the same time. And this is what makes it um, 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 what makes for spectacular effects um, in these systems. So uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So you might ask the question, um, can we actually see Bose-Einstein uh, uh, condensation occurring pretty much with the naked eye? And the answer is yes, uh, nowadays. Uh, for many, many years, Bose-Einstein condensation was believed to be occurring in helium, but we had no direct evidence for that. In the case of the ultra-cold atomic gases, uh, we have direct evidence in the following way. If we trap, if we create a trap with a, a magnetic or laser potential, um, then the atoms in question will be confined within the trap. And in the normal state, which means T above the temperature T sub C for Bose-Einstein condensation, the distribution of uh, atoms, which we can actually see pretty much directly by, by um, doing an absorption experiment uh, with light, um, th this distribution is pretty broad and has no spectacular features. Uh, next slide, please. However, if we go below the temperature for Bose-Einstein um, condensation and uh, consider what would happen for a non-interacting Bose gas, then we find that all the atoms in the condensate go into the lowest single particle um, energy eigenstate of the system. And that single particle energy eigenstate, the ground state, is very, very um, narrow in width compared to the range of the potential. Uh, so you get this huge uh, peak sticking out um, at uh, when you go below the temperature for Bose condensation. Meanwhile, the normal component, uh, those are the red and green guys in the science magazine picture, they're still basically doing their own thing. They don't have to take any notice of what's happening to the condensate. And so they're still spread out as they were in the normal phase. Now that picture um, is actually not quite realistic because if you really try to pack the, the atoms too closely together, you'll get a rather strong repulsion between them. So that tends to broaden out this um, very spectacular peak. And can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah. And if we, so this is a more realistic picture. We do, we do still have a peak and it's broadened, but it still is rather spectacular. And again, the normal component is still um, doing its own thing and constituting a wide background. And you can, experiments were first done in 1995 on, on this. And sure enough, one can actually see the, uh, in, for example, the, the pattern formed by the absorption of light on a photographic plate behind the, the system. You can actually see this peak rising out, out of the normal, normal uh, distribution. And I sometimes um, uh, ask my experimental colleagues who work in this area, well, could I actually go up to your apparatus and actually see with my own naked eye the gas forming the Bose condensate of this peak occurring? And their reply is, well, yeah, sort of, but I really didn't stick your, light, your eye in the laser beam. So I never have actually done that, but in principle, it is possible, I guess. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, uh, this is a bit technical, and don't worry if you don't understand this, or all of this um, diagram, uh, all of this uh, slide, because nothing else is going to depend on it. But uh, the idea of Bose condensation does in fact explain um, some of the, the more spectacular effects associated with liquid helium 
or heated before the loft size below the so-called lambda point of about two degrees absolute. The first um, spectacular effect has to do with um, the behavior under rotation. Suppose we um, take an annular geometry, like a sort of circular flower ball, and um, uh, fill it with liquid helium. Um, well, uh, we can define, uh, for a purpose you'll see in a moment, we can define a characteristic velocity or angular, sorry, angular velocity, omega sub c, for uh, the helium confined in this geometry. Um, it's h, uh, h bar, uh, some of you may know, is simply h over the Planck's constant divided by 2 pi. It's just a convenient notation. So this critical um, an angular velocity is uh, h bar divided by the mass of the helium atom divided by the square of the radius of the uh, container. And in the case of a realistic um, experiment uh, where the container might, size of the container might be say a centimeter or so, a bigger C is a very small number. It's about one revolution per hour. But you'll still ask the question, if we rotate the, the walls of, of the um, container, with an angular velocity, which is of this order or less, what does the liquid do? Well, you know what happened to water. Um, the water will simply rotate uh, with the container and it would actually form a slight, slight menis meniscus, which would enable you to see that it was rotating with the container. And that's for the following reason. There is a general principle which says that the angular velocity of the atoms, omega bar say, is as close to as possible to omega. Um, however, uh, there's a complication. The single atom states must obey the so-called quantization condition, which is illustrated um, in the diagram to the right of the slide. The wavelength or, or wavelength, the uh, series of waves which describe the system must be able to fit into the um, circumference of the container, which means that uh, when there must be an, in, uh, an integral number of wavelengths in the circumference to buy off. Now combine that with the, um, the, the definition of the de Broglie wavelength, lambda is h over mv, what you find is that the angular momentum of the system is quantized, some of you may know, know this result, it's a very generic one, um, L is n times h bar. Um, and that means in turn that the angular velocity is n times this characteristic value. But okay, but we don't seem to notice this effect in everyday systems like say water. So the question is why not? Because after all, I mean the water molecule is a quantum mechanical system for sure. So why, why don't we see the effects of quantization in water? Well, more generally, in a normal non-Bose non condensed system, uh, there are many different single particle states occupied, um, typically of the order of, uh, under, under reasonable experimental conditions, typically of the order of 10 million, so. So in order, and you remember, we want to get the average angular velocity of the atoms over the bar, as close as possible to the angular velocity of the wall. And you can easily do that in a normal system because all you do is to take um, the um, atoms and just shift them slightly between their original states, which they were in at rest. In that way, we can make omega bar almost exactly equal to omega. So the liquid will indeed rotate with the container and that's um, shown quantitatively on the uh, right-hand side, the upper, um, of the two lower di diagrams. However, what about a Bose condensed system? Well, for T much less than T sub C, almost all atoms are actually in the condensate. And that means they must all behave in exactly the same way. They must have exactly the same value of N. So it could be zero or one or two, um, but um, in any case, it must have one of those. So if we, in fact, 
uh, start from the system at rest. Well, um, if the walls are at rest, the system is certainly at rest. If we now start to rotate the system, but only with a very small angular velocity below half of this critical velocity omega sub c, then you find that the, the condensate is simply going to remain in its original state, that is at rest. Once we go beyond a half of omega c, it becomes more advantageous to get the condensate rotating with angular velocity omega c, and that gives you the step. Again, you'll stick there, and um, uh, then you'll uh, come to a point where the omega is twice omega c and you'll jump again and so forth. And incidentally, you, if you look at the, the region of the graph just um, to the right of omega c, you'll see that in, in those, for that angular velocity, the liquid, the helium, uh, is actually rotating faster than the container, which is very odd, but that's what happens. And as I say, this behavior has been uh, verified experimentally um, rather nicely. So, so this is one uh, spectacular effect immediately of those condensation. Uh, next slide, please. Um, however, there are more, sometimes more spectacular effects um, associated with superconductivity. First, first of all, let's just um, try to uh, explain for a moment what superconductivity is. Suppose I take a circuit um, which is composed partly of some normal metal, that's the black bit, um, that could be, for example, copper. But there's another part of the circuit, which is the blue bit, which is a metal like, say, aluminum. And what we're going to do is to drive a given current, um, A, um, through the circuit, and we're going to measure the voltage drop across the aluminum, the blue bit. And we find that at room temperature, uh, we find that the, well, the, resist, uh, the voltage is always proportional under these conditions to the current. So we can define the resistance by V of A, that's just a little Ohm's law. And we'll find that resistance at room temperature is um, reasonable. And it's a function of temperature. And if we go to, to lower temperatures, it does indeed decrease, um, but not spectacularly until we get to a temperature of about 1.3 K, 1.3 degrees absolute in the case of aluminum, when quite suddenly the voltage across the, the blue part, the aluminum, will drop to zero. And uh, uh, in other words, the, it will look as if the resistance is zero. This is the phenomenon which we know as superconductivity, and that's by now been seen in literally thousands of different uh, metals. Next slide, please. Uh, here's just a brief um, history of the highest temperature at which um, superconductivity was known. It was discovered by Kamerlingh Onnes, or to be more historically accurate, it is actually discovered by his lab assistant, but as usual, Kamerlingh Onnes got the credit, um, in uh, 1911. And um, it then rose very, very slowly until in the summer of 1986, it was somewhere around 25 uh, degrees. And then suddenly things ha started happening. The so-called high temperature or cuprate um, su super um, uh, conductors were discovered. Um, and uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, maximum temperature at which uh, superconductivity occurred, so-called T sub C, zoomed upwards. And within a few years, it was about 125 degrees, which is about 40% of room temperature. Over the last five years, six years, uh, something even more spectacular has happened. <coughs> uh, superconductivity was actually discovered to occur in um, hydrogen sulfide and other metallic sulfides at temperatures which are really getting very, very close to room temperature. In fact, there's certainly um, temperatures that are warmer than my garden here in Urbana, Illinois is probably right now. So that was very unexpected and uh, very spectacular. Um, so let's just try to discuss briefly um, how, the, uh, how the ideas which I've introduced um, based on uh, indistinguishability and, and so forth um, uh, can explain at least qualitatively that this phenomenon of superconductivity. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so we already said that there are two types of um, elementary particles. Um, those which have half integral spin in the appropriate unit. Those are the fermions at low temperatures. They, they really do something pretty boring. On the other hand, you have the uh, bosons, um, which have uh, integral spin. Um, and um, they um, are, show at low temperatures the spectacular phenomenon of Bose condensation. Now, the electrons and metals are actually spin a hop, so they should be fermions. And indeed, um, by themselves, single electrons do but seem to behave like single fermions. They show this rather boring behavior of the um, uh, condensing or uh, of, uh, filling up the Fermi C. However, a compound object which consists of an even number of fermions can only have spin zero or half, or, uh, sorry, zero or one or two. In other words, it forms a boson. So an even number of fermions does indeed form a boson. That, for example, happens in the helium-4 atom, which has six fermions. That's an even number. Helium-4 atom, therefore, is a boson. It can undergo Bose condensation. Next slide, please. So it turns out that um, at low enough temperatures in certain metals, you get so-called Cooper pairs formed. What that means is that, crudely speaking, me, sorry. Um, uh, crudely speaking, what happens is that two, a pair of electrons gets together to form a sort of dielectronic molecule. And you might think at first sight that the picture is therefore the one on the left, at the upper left of this uh, slide, um, where the molecules are quite tightly bound compared to the distance between them. But that's actually not right, at least not uh, according to the simplest theory, which does seem to describe uh, at least the so-called old-fashioned superconductors like aluminum. Rather, what happens is that the Cooper pairs are actually formed out of um, electrons, which are a large distance um, uh, from one another. That's the two, two um, encircled dots there. Um, and you see that between them are any number of other um, uh, electrons, which will form their own Cooper pairs. People sometimes compare this to a form of modern dance, in which my motion may be uh, correlated and strongly correlated with that of my partner, but she is way across the room, and between us there are any number of other couples all uh, doing their own things and correlating their own motions. So it's a very, very strongly uh, collective kind of, uh, of behaviour. Now, um, the amusing point is that in the simplest theory, the theory of so body cooper schrieffer theory, um, the, once the Cooper pairs are formed, they must automatically undergo Bose condensation. And that in turn means that they must all do exactly the same thing at the same time, not just in equilibrium situations, but also in non-equilibrium ones. And so let's consider the following analogy. Um, let's uh, imagine that we um, take a group of school children, um, which, um, and we uh, instruct them to run into a forest. Now, it has to be a natural forest, not a plantation. In other words, the, the trees in the forest are arranged at random. So here are the, the uh, children. This is the bottom left-hand uh, part of the slide. The ch children um, start running into the forest, but pretty soon some uh, um, child will come up against a tree. And um, since she doesn't have any special instructions, she'll swerve to avoid it and keep on running in the new direction. Um, and uh, so after a bit, the, uh, the uh, school children will all be running in completely random directions. Now, the analogue in a real uh, in a metal which is, is normal is that uh, you apply an electric pulse to the system, as a result of which the electrons are, um, are uh, accelerated um, <coughs> and uh, uh, they, they move through the metal. And in the metal, there are impurities, which are the analogues of the trees in the schoolchildren example. <laughs> Every 
um, very soon, um, some electron is going to run up against an impurity. Um, it'll be scattered and it has no special instructions, so it'll just go on in a new direction. And the uh, though the original um, situation, that is with uh, the extreme left of the uh, left of the bottom diagram, uh, although originally the electrons were all moving together and there's a large current, after a few minutes, the electrons will be moving in random directions, no more current. So that's what happens in a normal metal. And in fact, if you do the experiment with a superconducting ring, sorry, with a, with a normal metal ring, the current will tend to die away over a period of maybe uh, a millionth or a billionth of a second, very fast. Now, however, let's consider a different analogy. <laughs> let's suppose we're dealing, we have the same forest, we're dealing um, not with a group of school children, but the group of well-drilled soldiers. And these soldiers have the instruction that as, as far as possible, they need to all keep in step. Um, so you start them off um, and uh, start them off running into the uh, forest. Um, sooner or later, um, one of these, um, actually a pair of electrons, not a single electron, but a pair of electrons will run up against a, um, a, an impurity. Um, are they, in the case, sorry, I'm fixing my, my examples, We're still talking about the soldiers. The soldier will run up against a tree um, and he will swerve to avoid it. However, he has strict instructions that he must keep in step with his fellow soldiers as far as possible. So having uh, avoided the tree, he will get back into step with all the other soldiers. And even after quite a long time, all the uh, soldiers will look as if they're marching forward in unison. So the analog of that is the Cooper pairs and the superconductor. A, um, we start all the Cooper pairs moving together. Um, a particular Cooper pair may hit an impurity, swerve to avoid it, but it knows it has to behave exactly similar to all its mates. So it gets back into, uh, into step with all the others. And even after a long time, all the uh, pairs uh, are uh, moving uh, forward in the same way as they originally were. So if I take, a, say, a superconducting ring um, below its transition temperature, and uh, for example, I can um, vary the magnetic flux through it so as to produce a, um, a, a voltage pulse or an EMF around the ring. So at the start off, the electrons moving. Um, and if it's a normal metal, they will very soon get scattered and stop. If it's a superconductor, basically by the mechanism I've indicated, they'll go on um, flowing essentially forever. And in fact, um, people have established that as long as I'm a reasonable amount below the transition temperature, then the lifetime of the supercurrent once it's set up, and once I keep, if I keep the temperature well below the transition temperature, it's much, much larger than the age of the universe. And so that's um, uh, at least a qualitative explanation of why uh, some metals show this extraordinary behavior. So basically, that's what I want to tell you. I hope I've now given you at least some idea of why the uh, phenomenon, not just of quantum mechanics, but of the indistinguishability of elementary particles, leads to this quite, this, uh, quite extraordinary range of um, effects at low temperatures. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. It's now time to move on to the question and answer session. I and Dan would be simultaneously reading out the questions posted both on the Zoom and YouTube platform. So in case you're unable to hear us or due to lack of clarity or any technical issue, we would definitely repeat the question. Okay, thank you. Okay, sir. So shall we begin with the first question? Right. It's from Mahadevan AR. He has asked, what is the actual use of a quantum liquid? <laughs> Very good question. Um, I actually, um, uh, I actually, uh, as some of you might know, in 2003, I received the, um, uh, the Nobel Prize um, for uh, my research on, on um, superfluid helium-3, which indeed is a quantum liquid. And of course, we went to Stockholm and uh, uh, there were uh, lots of press conferences with um, journalists and so forth. And 
another um, member of my own uh, university um, who got the Nobel Prize at the same time as I did, the same year, but in medicine, uh, was uh, the late um, uh, Paul Milderbrook. So generally speaking, they take us together at the press conferences and the journalists would ask um, uh, Paul Lodebois, um, please explain to us what is the significance of your research? Well, Lodebois was effectively the inventor with others of the so-called MRI, magnetic resonance imaging technique. And so he was able to say, well, as a result of using this technique, we've been able to diagnose um, literally millions of people with various kinds of uh, disease. We've been able to, uh, to plan treatments and, and, and save, uh, if not millions, at least hundreds of thousands of lives using this technique. So, of course, the journalists were very happy. And then they'll turn to me and say, and now, Professor Leggett, can you explain what is the, um, the uh, use uh, of superfluid helium-3? And I would have to look at them and tell them, well, I'm afraid that if you mean direct practical concert, uh, practical applicability, superfluid helium-3 is probably the most useless system ever devised by mankind, or ever, ever found experimentally. Uh, the reason for that is that, first of all, helium-3 is extremely scarce. We're, uh, the world is always um, about to run out of helium-3, and we all get urgent messages telling us to around three in the world, uh, they still wouldn't amount to very much, um, and so would not be really of much practical applicability. Second point is that it only occurs below about 100,000th of room temperature. So, so helium-3 is really not a very practical um, material. However, I think um, what one would say is that by uh, thinking about helium-3 and doing experiments on it, we've been able to develop a whole set of ideas which can then be developed for other, can then be applied to other quantum liquids, like say, the high temperature superconductors. And the high temperature superconductors really are, um, even now, of considerable use. Um, in, uh, for example, um, the, um, in the US, there are three major grids, electrical grids, um, and apparently they're all joined together at uh, some point in Texas, I forget exactly where. Um, and it's very essential that, the, um, uh, that if one of, one of these three uh, grids is, becomes suddenly overloaded, um, th then you should be able to switch the uh, power to uh, one of the other two. And so there's this, uh, I forget what the technical name for it is, but there's this uh, device uh, down in Texas, which accomplishes this switching. But right now, as far as I know, it's made, base, it's made just based on conventional materials. It turns out the enormous advantages of doing this with a superconducting material, and uh, uh, this is actually being uh, developed in real life. A second um, practical application, which is a little further in the future, perhaps, is long, long distance power transmission. Most of the power that we use, uh, certainly in, uh, uh, in the US and I suspect also in India, most of the electrical power which is used is actually generated at points that are quite distant from the point of consumption. Typically, at least in the case of the US, of the order of 1,000 or 2,000 kilometers. So that means that uh, a lot, there's a lot of electrical loss um, during the purpose of, of uh, power, the course of power, power transmission, which would, right now is typically along uh, copper wires and so forth. Copper is a pretty good conductor, but it's certainly not perfect. And so, so there are very reasonable losses along um, the, the transmission lines. And um, I believe the figure is that this uh, is about some, right now, something like eight to 10% of all the world's electrical energy uh, gets lost in this way. Now, if one could make one's transmission lines out of uh, superconductors and, and of course keep them superconducting, then that loss would be totally eliminated. And that would be a huge, a really huge uh, economical effect. Right now, that is not happening. There, there is a little area in the Brooklyn uh, suburb of New York 
where the very last kilometer of the electrical power transmission is actually done by a superconducting uh, transmission line cooled by liquid nitrogen. But that's just a demonstration project. And it'll be some time before um, superconducting transmission lines become the, uh, the regular thing. But I think it probably will happen um, within at least your lifetime, if not within mine. Um, there are various other uh, kinds of application. Um, for example, um, uh, magnetometry. The, um, you can detect very, one, of, one of the applications of a, a superconductor is that can measure very small changes in magnetic field. And this can be used as a diagnostic of the, um, uh, of the currents which are flowing in your brain and therefore uh, give clues as to possible medical treatments and so forth. Um, and there are various other applications, but I think those are probably the main ones right now. Thank you, sir. The next question is from Rahul Ram. He has asked, is there any relation between quantum liquid and quantum spin liquid? Oh, <laughs> yeah, uh, interesting question. Um, I think it's mostly the name. A, um, uh, a, I think one usually uses the phrase quantum spin liquid to refer to a group of electrons, usually in two dimensions, uh, not necessarily so, but it's usually um, electrons in a single um, a layer, which will uh, not undergo um, Co Cooper pairing, but may undergo different uh, other kinds of phase transition or other kinds of order. Um, and in particular, the um, behavior of the spins in the liquid may be very um, peculiar and different from that of other, uh, other more widely known systems. So I, so I think the only, only real um, analog is that you indeed have a liquid in both cases, in both, both uh, the quantum spin liquid and in a superconductor. It is true that the electrons are liquid, they are moving around one another, uh, whereas in an insulator, they would be, of course, be pretty much fixed. Um, and the other thing in common is that uh, quantum mechanics is important for both. But apart from that, I, I think it's really mostly the same. Thank you, sir. Our next question is from Sakshi Negawikar. Can we observe no rotation effect in other liquids apart from helium? Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, that's indeed interesting. Um, so f there is, um, let's see, to, to, to observe or to expect, to expect to observe the effect, um, the liquid in question would have to be both condensed. So far, the only um, liquid which has been uh, known to undergo um, both a condensation or Cooper pairing uh, it is uh, liquid helium. Um, it has been speculated that if you could um, prepare liquid hydrogen, say, uh, under uh, very special conditions, for example, in very narrow pores, so it might undergo both condensation. That's sort of uh, that's a bit controversial right now, both on the theoretical and the experimental front. And to the best of my knowledge, um, no one has ever tried to do uh, seriously do a no rotation experiment with hydrogen. Uh, other, in the case of other elements besides um, helium and hydrogen, um, I think the temperature you'd have to go to is below the um, temperature at which um, uh, which the system will just freeze and form a solid. However, I should just perhaps um, correct myself a little. Um, the no rotation experiment has been observed in ultra cold atomic gases. And um, in some sense, the distinction between a gas and a liquid, particularly in these very, uh, very cold systems, is, is somewhat artificial. So you could say that this is a second kind of, of quantum liquid in which the no rotation effect has been. In fact, observed. Thank you, sir. The next question is from Divyadeep Singh. He asks, do we consider these copper pairs as quantum entangled system? 
uh, well, I think the, the straight answer is yes. <laughs> um, the, uh, as I say, the Cooper pairs are basically a sort of dielectronic molecule. Um, and if you think into, uh, now, you see, here, this is an interesting point. If you think um, about the basic objects or the basic degrees of freedom as being, say, the, the spins of the two um, electrons involved, then the spins are forming a so-called spin singlet state, and the spin singlet state is very definitely entangled. Um, on the other hand, of course, it is possible also to think in terms of the a sort of collective variable, that is, for example, the center of mass, uh, position, and the total spin. And if you actually formulate things in terms of those variables, you're not entangled. So the whole notion, this illustrates a point which I think is often overlooked, the whole notion of entanglement is dependent, at least to some degree, on the basis in which you're expressing things. Um, I think most people will say um, the natural basis is the individual particle positions and spins, and then the answer is certainly yes, they are entangled. Thank you, sir. Our next question is from a professor, Justin, sir. So have you managed to adjust the angular velocity of the quantum liquid by adjusting the moment of inertia of the particles? What are the other options available for adjusting the angular speed? What are the oh. uses or advantages? <laughs> uh, okay, yes, uh, if you um, uh, want to um, adjust the uh, angular velocity that um, does, uh, well, it's just related directly to the um, moment of inertia. Um, and you, uh, for a uh, given uh, liquid, say, like helium, helium uh, by changing the dimensions of the sample, you could adjust the angular velocity. Um, however, there's something much more interesting, really. What you can do is adjust the temperature. Now, the, um, you remember, I said that the liquid would, would, um, uh, behave in this peculiar way uh, with the steps in angular velocity, that was at zero temperature. At um, non-zero temperature, the curve looks a bit different and does depend on the temperature. So what you can do is you can take, say, liquid helium, um, put it in a rotating container, a container which is already rotating at uh, way above the transition temperature, okay? Uh, the liquid will, of course, rotate with the uh, container, just like water. Uh, now you cool it down through the transition temperature and you will find that there is a small um, decrease in angular uh, momentum uh, because the, uh, the um, angular velocity, omega, is now quantized. However, the angular momentum is, crudely speaking, proportional to the moment of inertia precisely associated with the condensate times the angular velocity. So if you can change the moment of inertia, not of the whole system, but of the condensate by, ch by changing the temperature, then uh, you change the uh, angular momentum, although the angular velocity will still be constant. And you can actually go up and down doing this, cooling and heating, and the angular momentum will increase and decrease, whatever, as long as, long as you don't go above the transition temperature. So, uh, so as long as you stay in the superfluid phase, um, then yes, you can uh, almost adjust it at will. Thank you, sir. The next question is from Baswaraj Kagali. He's asked, what fraction of electrons in a quantum liquid forms copper pairs? Well, the usual belief is that um, it is the um, so-called conduction electrons, which um, in a typical metal would only be a rather small fraction of all the electrons. Most, most of the electrons um, are in um, uh, completely occupied bands. And once you have a completely occupied band, it really is impossible to form Cooper pairs. There's only the ones which are left out, there, the ones in the, in the conduction bands, which um, form Cooper pairs. Now, as I remarked in the case of helium, um, the, in the case of both condensation and helium, the, um, there's only a, a fraction of the electrons, uh, which do actually form Cooper pairs at a given temperature. So just below the transition temperature, only a very small fraction of all the, not just all the electrons, but even all the conduction electrons are forming Cooper pairs. 
by that. Now cool it, then more and more, a larger and larger fraction will do so. And we, we believe that at zero temperature, then all the conduction electrons will form Cooper pairs. But the, the ones in the valence bands, uh, the core um, bands, are just doing nothing mostly all the time. So, so it really is a mostly a small fraction. Thank you, sir. Our next question is again from Baswiraj Kagali. Can one produce quantum liquid with neutral particles like neutrons? Absolutely. And in fact, um, the, I am not myself an uh, astrophysicist, so my knowledge is rather second-hand of this, but, um, um, but people who study neutron stars um, believe that, um, uh, at least in the uh, crust of neutron stars, the neutrons, and uh, in some cases also the protons, may indeed form for the pairs. And uh, uh, the, there was some very nice work done on this in the um, 70s and 80s of the last century by my, my colleagues here at the University of Illinois, um, uh, the late uh, David Pines and Chris Becker, Ian Gordon Bain, and, and others. Um, and um, they were able to explain quite a large number of the properties of neutron stars um, by this, uh, this idea that you were indeed getting Cooper pairs formed out of neutrons and occasionally protons. Thank you, sir. The next question is from Vaishnavi Suresh. She's asked, Sir, is Cooper pair formed only in superconductors or is it also formed in insulators? <laughs> um, most people, um, I think, would... Um, uh, say uh, it's formed only in uh, superconductors, but there's a rather tricky point here. Um, this special uh, kind of insulator, um, sometimes called the Anderson in 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 insulator, uh, which can occur in a system which would be a metal, but you've put so much dirt and impurity into it, is now a very disordered alloy. And if you've got enough disorder, then it turns out that the single electron states will be localized and therefore the system will behave like an insulator. Now, a very fascinating idea, which was proposed independently by, um, uh, um, let me the, um, a couple of Russian theorists, um, Sorry, come back to me. Um, a couple of Russian theorists in, uh, in the former Soviet Union and by Ma and Lee in the US. Very interesting idea was that um, if you could switch on a weak attractive interaction between the electrons in such a system, it might actually, uh, the electrons might form Cooper pairs. But what is really fascinating is that um, as a result of the formation of the Cooper pairs, this material, which previously had been an insulator, would, could actually become a superconductor. So if this is right, then you could take this material and at room temperature and so forth, it would be completely insulating. And then when you drop below a particular temperature, it would actually become a superconductor without ever having gone through the normal metal phase in between. And so that was a theoretical idea proposed in the mid 80s. And people still are still arguing about whether there's any experimental evidence for it or not. Uh, my own view is that the evidence is um, perhaps suggestive, but by no means compelling. That we have seen this sort of thing. Thank you, sir. So is it fine if we continue the question and answer session for a few, few more minutes? Uh, well, yes, I'd like to finish fairly soon after 10 o'clock if we could, because uh, there are things I have to do about the house, but yeah. Okay, so just a few more questions, sir, and we'll wind it up. So our next question is from Divya Deep Singh. So, sir, how can we say that helium-3 may give rise to a perpetual machine one day? Can we say so? Uh, no, I'm afraid not. I, uh, I, I don't think the general principles of physics, which uh, uh, tell you that you can't construct a, a perpetual motion machine, are... Uh, uh, I, I, I think they apply just as much to helium-3 as, as anything else. However, what you may be thinking of, I think, is that um, the, um, there is no theorem which says that the 
uh, rate of dissipation of energy in a physical system has to be non-zero. There's no. Uh, what it says is that um, it uh, there are certain kinds of machine um, with certain kinds of working principle um, which you uh, cannot which cannot violate. Well, can't, uh, obviously I think cannot violate the first or second laws of thermodynamics. Um, what you can what you can do with superconductivity is really a bit boring. You can basically get just get the same state continuing forever. You can't really uh, use it or not uh, obviously use it um, to, uh, for example, um, generate external uh, work. Um, so in that sense, I don't think you could really um, construct a perpetual motion machine. But the, but in fact, the whole the whole notion of a perpetual motion machine does need rather careful definition, I think. So, to, so my answer is, I think, to some extent, it would depend on, on the definition, but in any interesting uh, uh, sense, I think the answer is no. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have a lot of questions. However, we do not have the time to ask all of them. So we shall wind it up with the last question, sir. It's from Rohit Shajan. It's a two-part question. The first part is, can we create a superfluid using heat as a source instead of cooling it? And the second part is, how can we utilize the superconductivity created by this superfluid? Well, uh, I'm not quite clear um, what the questioner means by using heat um, instead of cooling. Um, I, I don't, certainly is no case known where you have a system, you have a material which is um, normal, let's say normal at room temperature, and then becomes a superfluid at higher temperatures. And I, I guess there are rather general arguments which um, shows that this is uh, extremely unlikely, if not totally impossible. Um, so, if, so in that sense, I think uh, it is not possible to use heat. Um, but uh, I wonder if the questioner had something else in mind. We're not sure, sir. That's the question we got. Okay. Well, perhaps we'll just take one more since that was rather quick. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I mean, if uh, uh, if the um, if we believe that um, it's not not possible to create a um, superfluid or superconductor um, from heat, then I guess the the second part of the question: What could you do with such a superconductor? Um, really uh, becomes invalid. Yeah. So do you want to take one more question? One more question. Yeah, Dan. Dan, is there is is there one more question? That um, you, sir, uh, like so we have uh, one question. Can you please comment on the superconductivity in two dimensions? Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, if you ask many physicists that question, or at least if you had asked them that question, say 30 years ago, many of them would have responded that superconductivity is not possible in two dimensions. Um, however, that was based, I think, on misinterpretation of a theorem which says that, um, strictly speaking, you cannot, cannot get um, Bose condensation or Cooper pairing um, in two dimensions at any non-zero temperature. That's a very formal theorem. Um, what I think is most certainly true um, is that, and has been seen experimentally in uh, many systems by, by now, is that um, there are many two-dimensional systems of electrons which do show uh, superconducting behavior um, below some temperature of the order of a few degrees, say. Um, so, uh, for all intents and purposes, um, showing a uh, persistent currents and so forth, then um, you can, in fact, get superconductivity in two dimensions. Although it tends to be quite not quite so robust as it would be in an ordinary three-dimensional system. Thank you, sir. Since we're running out of time, it's time to wind up. We'd just like to say that we had got a lot of wonderful questions from the participants, and we ensure that the unanswered questions will be forwarded to the speaker. Well, uh, now I would like to invite Mr. Ajay Jose, Secretary, 
the Berkman's Erudite Lecture Series to deliver the vote of thanks. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Dan. Hello, everyone. It's indeed a great fortune to have the Nobel Laureate, Professor Anthony James Leggett, deliver the 2020 Bell's Erudite Lecture. I am sure the lecture and the interactions have fascinated and ignited the minds of young, many young philosophers. Dear Professor Anthony James Leggett, Sir, on behalf of St. Berkman's College community and uh, all the participants, I extend our sincere gratitude to you. Thank you. I thank all the participants for their support and lively interactions. Let me also acknowledge the overwhelming support and cooperation for Bells from the management of SB College. On behalf of Bells Committee, I thank Reverend Father Thomas Padiath, manager, and Dr. Jacob Matthew, the principal of SB College. This program offers very much to the enthusiasm of Professor P.J. Thomas, the convener of Bells. Thank you very much, sir. I thank all the well-wishers and staff members of SB College, especially the faculty members of the Department of English, Physics, and Chemistry. Special thanks to the comparing duo, Dan and Nina. Once again, thank you all. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have now come to the end of our Berkman's Erudite Lecture. It was indeed a pleasure to have you all with us today. Feedback forms are provided in the chat box, uh, so you can fill them accurately. So the rest of the questions would definitely be addressed to our speaker. So thank you for joining us today and have a wonderful time ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Leggett.